Well, we are a part of this movement. It continues to take place today and uh, we're wrapping up a series of messages. If you've been with us, if you haven't been, maybe you're online, first time with us today, uh, I want to tell you kind of where we've been. We've been talking about this movement of the spirit among us, which is what we call the church. It's who we are today. These are our people. This is our tribe. It goes all the way back to the resurrection of Jesus. Today's Pentecost Sunday. Now for us Baptists, we don't follow a liturgical calendar, so to speak. A litos ergos means work of the people or public service, really is what it means. Uh, services that are, that are celebrated together in a Christian calendar. And I say that because across the globe, a lot of Christian traditions and different ones are celebrating with us today, Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is the day that the Spirit came upon the people. So we're going to be in Acts 2 if you want to go ahead and grab your Bible. And I'm going to do a little review. We'll be there in, in just a bit to set it up. Because what we're going to see is that Pentecost Sunday actually has a lot of history behind it. Not only in a Christian calendar, but much further. It is actually really adopted from, uh, from a, a Hebrew calendar, from a biblical calendar calendar way back to the book of uh, Leviticus. You can find it in Leviticus 23. What we've been saying uh, throughout this time together is uh, that the purpose of the church really is to make disciples. We started by saying that yes, the power of the church is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is the promised Holy Spirit that will come. We're going to look at today. Uh, the purpose of the church is to make disciples. Uh, he said, the plan is to start where you are, uh, in your Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. We said, this is the outline of the book of Acts. This is what has happened, continues to happen from Dallas. We start here. We start with our neighbor. We start in our home. We go from there to our workplace. It goes out further and further till we are out reaching the entire world. In our church, praise God, we're a part of a church that is not only going out as we can travel, but also supporting missionary work around the world today. And so we said that the plan is start where you are. The people of the church, uh, well, every member's a minister. We've been calling everybody to serve, to find your place to serve. The question you should answer, if you're a member of the church, or how about this, if you're a follower of Jesus, what's your ministry? What are you doing? How are you serving others? Yes, in the church and outside the church. And as Corey noted earlier, we are opening up our brand new children's space in due time, in due season. But we are calling forth our entire church family to serve the next generation, to serve our children. We got VBS coming up. I know my wife, Stacy, among others, uh, Megan, Corey's wife, all are serving. Many of us are serving through VBS. And there's an opportunity for you to do the same. As we serve everyone serving, particularly this next generation. We said last week, the proclamation of the church is that there's no other name by which we can be saved apart from the name of Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to again talk about the power of the spirit, the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of the power part two, okay, the sequel. But we're really backing up now as we walk through many uh, parts of the book of Acts. And we're going back to Acts 2. This is the day of Pentecost. Again, uh, this was uh, originally, and still is, a Hebrew, it's called Shabbat. It's a, it's a Jewish holiday. One of three key holidays where they go back to, to the temple to present themselves before the Lord, is what we see in, in Scripture. And, and so it's 50 days, it literally means 50. Uh, 50 days, Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover. But it was also, this is interesting, it was also the day that commemorated the giving of the Torah, the giving of the law. So that great moment in their history, Moses giving the law to the people. Interestingly, as a Christian holiday, 50 days after Easter, it commemorates the giving of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit which empowers us to obey the law of love, the way of Jesus. So you can see how all of redemptive history is being played out even in this 
holiday. You know, if I were to ask you, what are the key moments in all of redemptive history, uh, some, some, or in church history, some have noted this is today the Pentecost day of Pentecost, the third greatest day in the, in the history of the church, noting that you have Good Friday, right, the, the day of the cross, and you have the day of resurrection, Easter. So we do kind of follow, don't we, a liturgical calendar, sort of, a Christian calendar. We have Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So we follow these things along today, kind of unique for us here at our church to celebrate Pentecost Sunday, the bringing of the Spirit. Now, of all the days that we see in Scripture, the day of, you could, you could go back to the day of Advent, right? The day of his first arrival, the day of the cross, the day of his resurrection, this central point of all history in our message, the day of, of the giving of the Spirit that has now come to us. And then it goes all the way to the day, to that day, the final day of his consummation, his return, the second coming, and the consummation of all things. That's where everybody talks about this nowadays, but literally this is where all of history is heading. You and me, every person on the planet, standing before God Almighty, having to reckon with his holiness and our sinfulness. And all that will matter is what we've done with Jesus. So there's coming the day. But today is the day for us to give our hearts completely to him. A lot of times, you know, I think as Baptists, and if you know this passage at all, you know it's about to get freaky, okay, in Acts 2. It gets crazy. Uh, and as Baptists, we don't know what to do with the Spirit, right? Some, some people just, you know, all these expressions and all the, the manifestations of the Spirit and people getting all emotional. All, we don't know what to do with that. Some of us and others would say, well, you know, you're just sitting there and you're just spiritually dead, evidently. So there's, we have all of that going on when in reality there is an expression of the Spirit at work in us, an expression of joy, of gratitude, not just in worship, but in our lives. Christians do unusual things because we're prompted by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see some of that today. I, I heard it said, and I understand this sentiment, it says if you get too much of the Word, as if you could, you'll dry up. Okay, if you don't practice what you're hearing, practice and put your faith to work. Uh, you get too much of the Spirit, well, you blow up. And then they said if you, if you get both, you grow up. So here in our church, listen, if you're new here, it's spirit and the word. It's truth and grace. It's compassion and conviction. It's heart and mind. It's the spirit at work in our hearts. And yes, there's a display of the spirit in us. You can sense when someone is filled with the spirit. By the way they worship, by the way they act, by the way they love. And a watching world looks at us and how we love each other across in, uh, uh, you know, generational lines, across ethnic lines, across, you know, we, we wouldn't be together otherwise. And they see how we love each other like Jesus and they say, what is this? The church is the visible body of Christ and the watching world says, what is this? Why do you love the way you do? Why have you come over to me, neighbor, to help me or to see if I'm okay? Why are you serving my children when they aren't, they're not your children? What is this? And today I want you to see, if there's a title to this message, this is that. This is what God has been up to all along. It's what he's planned for you and me, for all creation, for all the while. This is that. This power of the Spirit is that of the Holy Spirit. This presence is that of the Holy Spirit. This purpose he's now given us is that of the Holy Spirit. All right, so Acts chapter two, we'll start with verse one. When the day of Pentecost arrived, now that you know what we're talking about here, they were all together in one place 50 days after Passover. So right about 50 days after the resurrection. Uh, so here in the book of Acts, as, 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 um, as the writer Luke noted in, in Acts 1, 1, he said, I told you, Theophilus, in the book of Luke, okay, my first letter, what Jesus began to do. We started the series this way. He continues. Now I'm going to tell you what he continues to do. Often we call it the acts of the apostles. I think rightly it's the acts of the Holy Spirit. And it's the same acts that he's doing through us in our lives. Many of the same. Not all as we'll note today I think. But here it says that they were all there. Now who's all? You can look at Acts 1.15. There's about 120 people. So we're at the very beginning of the church the spirit has not yet come. You could say that the church has not yet been birthed. 
Notice that the birth of the church takes place in a prayer gathering. They're in the upper room, it says earlier. It seems that they come together, 120, packed into this place. They're all there, and it says in verse 2, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. In a room, we're going to see three phenomena, okay? The first is audible. They hear something. Next is visual, and then it's going to be um, um, oral, okay? But notice it says, Note it says like the blowing of violent wind. So, so this, is not, this is not a meteorolo- meteorological phenomenon. This is like. They've never seen anything like this. And what they're going to see is like. So they're, they're describing this. And, and, and Luke, our writer, is describing what's going on because he's never seen it before. They've never seen this. There's only one birth, Right? There's only, there's a singular birth that's never happened before. And here it is. The birth of the church is taking place like you. There's only one birthday. The church is being birthed. And so the spirit does this miraculous thing. What is this? What is this? What is this power revealed? This power is that of the Holy Spirit, as we'll see here. This is that. Look at verse 3. And divided tongues as of, check that out, like, okay, as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. So it's like fire. Was it real fire? It wasn't burning their heads. It wasn't, or, or it looked like fire. It seemed like fire. So what's going on here? We got wind and fire. And what's happening is both wind and fire are symbols of the presence of God. Don't miss that. That's what's happening. In fact, uh, in the Old Testament, the word ruach is the word that's used for, for wind or breathe, breath. And the word pneuma, maybe you've heard that word in the Greek, is, this, is the same. It means wind or breath. Here's what's happening. The body of Christ, the church, is given life by the breath of God. The spirit is coming upon a people and it's about to give birth. To the church. Look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. All filled with the Holy Spirit. Began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now this is where it gets strange, right? And amazing. All of them, it says. All 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now among them, don't miss this. Mary Magdalene. Uh, was among them. Mary, the mother of Jesus, it says in chapter one, verse 14, names her. The apostles are there. We can assume Martha is there. The other disciples, all the women who were there when Jesus was resurrected, we, we, they're all here together and the spirit, listen, fills all of them. Fills women and men, boys and girls. The spirit does not give out gifts according to sex, Okay. All equal at the foot of the cross. This is a new and radical thing because God is no respecter of persons. It says in Acts 10, 34, there's no male, there's no female, there's no Greek, there's no Jew. The spirit is coming upon all of them, all of his sons and daughters. And we see tongues. These are tongues of different languages, by the way. There's two types of tongues you see in the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, Paul speaks of a, of a spiritual language that has to have interpretation or it's just mumbo jumbo. It doesn't mean much to anyone. Okay, so it's, a, it's kind of an insider language, if you will. And, 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 and some, some think, well, that was kind of, a, kind of an early church thing and, it's in, and it doesn't happen anymore. Others say, no, it continues to happen. It happened to me, someone might say, or it's never happened to me personally. In fact, it says utterances that we really can't even, even speak. But there are two types of tongues that are talked about. Glossolalia, if you come from a, Kind of Pentecostal background, you've heard that word before. That's a a Greek word. And and speaking in in tongues. Here we see tongues that are literally a language that people will now understand. Okay, so it's getting everyone's attention. And what happens here is a once in a lifetime phenomenon. It is amazing. In verse five, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation 
under heaven. So now he's referring to the diaspora. You may have heard that word. It's a Greek word that means the dispersion. Okay, so it's a group of people. This is true about any group. Not in their, their national or local spot, but instead spread throughout the land. The Jews, via the exile, are spread throughout the land. And at this sound, what sound? The sound of this violent wind, the multitude came together and they were bewildered. They were astonished at what was happening. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Each one was speaking a language. And there's a little nuance here. It says they were hearing in their own language. I don't know if you ever thought about that. Were they really speaking, but they just understood? Here's what I think is happening. I think it explains this later more clearly. They are literally speaking a language that they did not understand, those speaking. And they were guided by the Holy Spirit to speak. And others were hearing that language, their language, clearly by people who did not know the language. This is astonishing. This is amazing. And look at what they say. And I'm guessing it was without accent, by the way. This is the reverse of the Tower of Babel, by the way. Genesis 11. Confusion, mayhem among the sinful people seeking to live for themselves. Now, those who God has called out to live for others receive the Spirit of God. And there's clarity and proclamation of truth. Complete reverse. Of the Tower of Babel. Verse 7. They were amazed and astonished. Just imagine this. Wouldn't we be saying. Are not all these who are speaking Galileans. There's a couple things going on here. On the one hand they're saying. Aren't these mostly country folk. These aren't educated people. They have one dialect. Is the other part of this. They speak Aramaic. This was the language of Jesus. Uh, It's it's a dialect of, of Hebrew. Now Hebrew was spoken in Jerusalem primarily. And it was the theological language. Not unlike we might say, well, Latin is, you know, this language of of academia or whatever. But it was was a spoken language. And and Jesus and the disciples primarily spoke Aramaic. And so they're saying, these are Galileans, they have one dialect. What What is going on here? This is utterly amazing. And it catches their attention. The wind catches their attention, or the sound, I should say, of wind. And now they're hearing this. Look at verse 8. And how is it that we hear each of us... In his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Eliamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, if you know the Bible map, this is all over the Mediterranean, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and all the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So you wonder, what were they saying? They were proclaiming the mighty works of God, perhaps praying for revival, praying that God would do a great work, proclaiming the truth of God. This is, don't miss this, a multi-ethnic movement from the start. We're the ones who run off to other places and and gathered with our own types. This is to be a multi-ethnic global movement from its inception. This This is so important to recognize. Listen. There are four key things I want you to see. Just pause with me. I think about this. The early early believers were set apart in a lot of ways, but I want to name four of them because they challenge our thinking. The early church, as we look at the book of Acts and into the epistles, the early church was known for caring for the poor and marginalized, caring for the outsider. Okay? The church is to be known for those who care for those who aren't from around here. Secondly, the church was known to be a multi-ethnic movement. So they, 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 they were known for racial justice and, and raising up the oppressed and raising up minorities. It was known for racial equity and social advocacy. It was a multi-ethnic family. So that a watching world would go, what is this? This is not supposed to be. This is that it's God's plan all along to bring together a family that don't look like each other different color skin from different generations and they all come together and they love each other like Jesus what is this this is a new body that's visible to people who are watching and then thirdly they were committed to the sanctity of human life every life matters because every person 
is, is, is created in the image of God. And the way I say it is from the womb to the tomb. They were known to care for every person. Not all of society was that way. Nor is our, our culture that way. And then fourthly, they practiced a new, radical, counterculture, biblical, I call it human sexuality. Sex between a man and a woman in the context of marriage alone. Known for this radical view, particularly in Rome, as the gospel spread. Now, if you're tracking with me here, you, you realize that those four things that we are to be known of cannot be put in a modern political framework that a lot of us want to kind of put right alongside our theology and scripture. You're going to have, you're in a dilemma. Now, it may create confusion, I know, and it creates some tension. But you're, you have a dilemma. You either follow the way, okay, of the world, one way or the other in our modern system, or you follow the way of Jesus. And you practice the way of Jesus that goes up against our culture on multiple levels. And so the Spirit of God calls these people together. And, and the reason I'm saying all this is because if you're a guest here, you need to know this. I've said it. We are a church that is focused, yes, spirit and the word. Truth and grace. Compassion and conviction. This is one of the marks of spiritual maturity, by the way. To be able to live in these nuances, to live in the tension, and to be okay with living in the tension because you're following Jesus and that's all that matters. And too many of us are selling ourselves out instead of following God's word as citizens of another kingdom. The power of the church is the Holy Spirit that resides in us to live this way. The power that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. This presence is that of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 12. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Here it is. What is this? What is this presence? But others, verse uh, 13, but others mocking said, well, they are filled with new wine. So some are saying, well, I'll tell you what this is. This is drunkenness. That's what this is. That was their explanation, right? But Peter, look at verse 14, stands and says, no, it's not. They're all Baptists. This cannot be. Um, you know, oh, no, it doesn't say that. I made, I made that up. That's kind of my, that's Bible, the remix or something. Um, no, as if that would happen, by the way. But uh, that was a joke too. Okay, verse 14. But Peter, standing with the 11, okay, so now lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Now, this is where you're supposed to stop, at least I did, and you're reading this, and if you know the Gospels, you're going, wait, 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 wait. This Peter? Is that Peter? This Peter is that Peter. He is standing up now. Listen, denied Christ three times, ran with his tail under his legs, hiding with the others. Now he's saying, listen up, everybody here, listen up, listen up. No, 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 let me tell you what's happening here. That Peter. Friends, listen. Every one of these apostles had been radically changed because they had seen the risen Lord. You've got to account for the boldness of these apostles as they give evidence, compelling evidence for the resurrection. Now you might say, well, I'm not so sure I believe the Bible. So, I, okay, okay. You've got to account for the birth of the church. Out of nowhere in history, the church is born. And the most compelling evidence of the resurrection is the fact that a people began to gather and worship Jesus as God. This is attested to in extra biblical material outside of the Bible. You've got to come to grips with that. The birth of the church out of the first century is the power of God among a people. And now here we are 2,000 years later. Even still, people in Dallas who drive by Northwest Highway right in front of me here go by every day not even aware of the gospel that has come to us and salvation that is in Christ. And we are called to tell them. Like Peter, to have that boldness of the spirit in us to go to our friends and love them boldly and to say, listen, let me tell you what this is. 
This is that. This is what God has been doing all along. It's what you have been looking for in your life, all of your life. This is the forgiveness that you've been looking for. Look at verse 15. Look at what happens. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour. He's saying it's only nine o'clock, which doesn't stop some people. But verse 16. But this is what was uttered, uttered through the prophet Joel. The King James literally says, this is that. This is what God has promised all along would happen. This is the biblical answer to that. And, and, and I want to just pause here for a moment and say, listen, everything we do should be guided by scripture. When, when we're loving our coworker tomorrow morning or, or this week, why did you do this? This is that. It's the way of Jesus. Why did you come over while you're working in your yard? You came over to see how I'm doing and you started helping me with my, why are you doing this? this is that? This is what God has done in my life. Why are you forgiving me taking that first step when I know I did you wrong if I'm honest? This is that. This is the power of God in me, the spirit in me. Everything we do should have a biblical answer. And Peter steps up and he says, let me tell you what this is. Look at verse 17. This is what the prophet Joel said. And in the last days it shall be done. God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and on your sons and daughters. Here it is again, sons and daughters. On, on sons and daughters, they shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. The men and women, the boys and girls, this supernatural anointing comes so that the world would be seen differently by those who know God. You might say, oh, I don't know if I've ever had a dream or a vision. Listen, I know a lot of friends who have, literally. I know a lot of Muslim friends who've come to Christ through, through dreams and visions. And you might say, well, I don't know if I've ever had a vision. Listen, as a Christian, you have a redeemed imagination. We see the world differently. We see the kingdom coming. And we know how this world ought to be because it's going to be. We have a redeemed imagination. We see a, a place where people are loved, not based on the color of their skin, but because of, yes, the content of the character or because they're created in the image of God. We see all people in the church who matter regardless of their background, regardless of their age. Every, we see the world differently. And we see what's coming. Look at verse 18. Even on my male servants, and here it is again, female servants. This is radical stuff. In those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. In those days, here we go, the last days. The last days. Now and forever. We are in now the last days, the church age, if you will. Hebrews 1, 12, it says, in the last days. He, he, you know, he spoke through prophets. He spoke through the law. But now in these last days, Hebrews 1 verse 2, it says, uh, it says, now he's speaking to us through Jesus in the last days, through his son. Notice that young men and young women, do you know that the church was originally, um, it was a youth movement. The, all the disciples were young. Have, you, have anybody seen The Chosen? Anybody watch that? Um, it's on, I think, YouTube. It's outstanding. But all, I love it. I remember when I was a kid growing up. It'd be like a picture of Peter, you know, on the wall somewhere in the Sunday school room. He's like, that guy's old, you know, and, and maybe he was old. I mean, it was old Peter, right? They all lived to be old, most of them, um, but they were young. They were, they were, most scholars believe they were in their twenties. Jesus died in his early thirties. This was a youth movement. He's saying young men in every great movement, great awakening takes place as a youth movement. Young people being captured by the spirit of God. Look at verse 19. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. You say, what is this? Joel, Joel 2 is talking about the day of the Lord. Look at verse 20. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. The day of the Lord. It's a preview of the coming attraction. When Christ will come again, and all who know him will be, be uh, taken up with him and come to the new earth to, to reign and rule with him and worship him for eternity. It says in verse 21, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friend, today still is true. You call upon the name of the Lord for salvation and he saves you. By your faith in what he has done. Look at verse 22. Men of Israel, 
Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. He says, you've seen it. He's already come. We've attested. We've seen it happen. This power is that of the Holy Spirit. This presence is that of the Holy Spirit. And look, finally, this purpose is that of the Holy Spirit. This spirit gives us purpose. It gives us obedience. And part of that obedience is to proclaim the gospel to everyone. The spirit resides in every believer. He resides in you if you've accepted Jesus. Look, Peter goes on. This Jesus, verse 23, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held He conquered death. And this is the message. The central message of the church from that day on is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 32. This Jesus, God raised up and and, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And then in verse 39, it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the the apostles, brothers, what, what shall we do? This sermon leads us as the spirit of God has spoken into your heart for us all to ask that question, Lord, what shall I do? I was sharing Christ with a young man not too long ago and I had not even finished all that I wanted to share about what Jesus had done for him. And before I could finish, he goes, what do I do? What do I do? What do I need to do? I knew he was tracking with me and following me. And he just said, what do I do? Like, Jeff, get on with it. What? What do I need to do? I said, you need to receive Christ right now. And he prayed and received Christ. Peter says, what do we do? What do we do? Look at verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. Friends, today the call is for each of us to repent. On this great day of the church, Reminds us that there's coming another day where all of history is heading. In fact, in Revelation, John puts it this way. He looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, every tribe, all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out to the Lord, salvation belongs, with one voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb, Jesus who's taken away the sins of the world. Friends, that's where all of history is coming. It's where it's heading. I guess there could be one more day added to the days. Before you get to that day, today is your day. The day when you join the story of what God's doing is the day that you come alive, finally. To live for him. Today is your day. So I'm going to pray as we close our time. But I've asked a few others to come and pray with me. Because we're going to have a few of our own come up and pray. And they're going to pray in different languages. And I'm going to close this out in English. They're going to pray for the spirit of God to move among us. Pray for revival. We have among us uh, Naomi Aguirre is a missionary. One of our own a missionary in Paris, France. He's going to pray in French. Johnny Merthodi. Merthodi is a, is, a, is a missionary as well here in, uh, in Dallas. He is with the BSM, Baptist Student Mission uh, Ministries at UTD. He's a cross-cultural specialist. Um, and he serves students there, this next generation, in a very diverse, on a very diverse campus, by the way. And then Mark Harrison. Mark is actually a new member of our church staff. He is leading our properties and services group, uh, that ministry. He is ministering to all who serve us so well. Mark just recently joined our staff. So uh, Naomi will be praying in French and then Johnny's gonna follow in Hindi. What is it? Telugu. That? Okay. (laughs) Did you say Telugu? Telugu. Telugu. Okay. That. And then Mark is going to be praying in Italian where he speaks fluent Italian and has served the Lord uh, in Italy as well. So, and then I'll close this in English. Let's pray together. 
Père Céleste, nous vous remercions pour la salut que tu nous donnes par Jésus. En nous transformant pour être plus comme Jésus, nous prions pour que notre amour pour toi ne soit pas silencieux. J'ai prié que nous partageons l'Évangile avec tous ceux que nous rencontrons, pas seulement en parole, mais aussi en action. Père, nous prions que pour un réveil spirituel. C'est là, c'est notre désir pour Dallas, pour Texas, pour l'Amérique, l'Europe, pour chaque tribu, pour chaque langue représentée dans le monde, qui devient affirmé pour l'Évangile. Nous prions pour qu'ils soient attirés à toi et ils reconnaissent qu'ils ont besoin de toi pour leur vie. Nous prions toutes ces choses au nom de Jésus. Amen. Amen. Marie-Rose Wakim, le Provacte, et Yoel, Joel, Wakdanam Chis, et Prochin Chinvedam Ganaina, Antidina Lo, Miru, Miyakat, but on the name Nimpta and Wakdanam Chis and Deodo Minaina. Alake Prava Ikaruna Prati Wokani, Miyaka Atmutu, Nimpi Prati Wokani Naina, Yoka Dallas Patanum Lonaka Kunda, Texas Rastum Lo, Marie Propancha Wakpan Ganaina, Niyoka Bidalga Wadkon, and Niyoka Swarthan Prashim Chetang Naina, Niyoka Swarthani. Mari Anni Anni Pranta Lakis Kaltaniki Pratyokani Battle Mir Ward Kornaina, Miyakat Mutan Panaina, Mariaka Akarlani Mir Tichin and Yoka Karlana Nani Tichinaina, Yoka China Pradhan Yesi Kristu, Adit Pachita and Shekti Kalamolo, Mike Sotral Chilinchi, Aruchinam Tandri. Amen. Dio Eterno, Padre Nostro, Tirin Garatiamo per questo giorno che ci ha dato per adorarti. Dio, ti preghiamo che la Chiesa in Italia sarà abbondantemente regalata con lo Spirito Santo di fare le cose della luce, la buona, buona notizia, il Vangelo, Padre nostro, che il tuo amore, la bontà che tiene Darai abbondantemente con tutti in Italia perché loro sono nel buio. Siamo graziamente chiedendo che tu sarai il Dio d'Italia. Ti ringraziamo per questo giorno e preghiamo tutte di queste cose nel nome di Gesù Cristo. Lord, now we all come before you. Those of us who speak English fluently have a message with people who can understand everything that we say. Lord, I pray that your name, the name of Jesus, will be on our lips this week. I pray we proclaim your name. And I pray for those who are here now. Friend, if you've never received Christ, that you would receive him now. Call upon the name of the Lord and you too can be saved. And you will join the throngs of people from every tribe, every nation on the planet. You will join those like Will Porter from China, who was adopted into the Porter family and now adopted into your family because he has received your grace. And we are all so amazed by how you transform our lives. We are in awe of you today. We are one family, and we go forth now to proclaim the good news of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen and amen.